everyone. Welcome to the Cultivate Podcast, the Grove Church, and I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and thank you so much for joining us. We are starting a new series today. We're going to be talking a little bit about kind of how the Christian is supposed to interact with politics. And as I was mentioning, that was going to be the series. Some people I was talking to were like, ooh, and I don't want to, I don't want to oversell this. I mean, we're not going to get too controversial here. It'll get progressively, I'll just kind of say a little bit more and more. If five people come up to me in the next two weeks and say, man, that was really good. I wish you would say more. I might would continue it. But otherwise, I just kind of want to stick to just kind of some basic principles that I think that the Bible clearly teaches. And then maybe towards the end and in the third episode, give you a little more insight into kind of some things that kind of drive the way that you know I think about politics and how we should vote, like the principles really, not who you should vote for or not going to give any advice on a particular party, but just kind of, I think, just some key principles. But again, for these first two episodes, we're going to look at what I believe are kind of the two primary passages that drive, really, that, that, that I think speak the most clearly on what our attitude is supposed to be like uh, with, with, with our government. And so if you were around, if you go to the Grove and you were there and we were kind of doing a little series at the back part of Romans and our known series, we skipped over chapter 13 and I kind of made this joke. I was like, hey, I, we're skipping over 13 because it talks about the government and you guys aren't ready for it. And it was kind of a little joke, but, but here we are. I've declared you now one month later, we are ready for it. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 13, the first seven verses. So I'll just read the passage as a whole, and then we'll just kind of come back through and just kind of make sure we are understanding exactly what it is that Paul is trying to tell us here. All right, so Romans chapter 13, starting verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason." They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. All right, so he kind of starts off there, which at the very beginning there in verse one with what many of us would call a very hot take. Um, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. All right, and so immediately when you start talking about this and the the things that Paul is saying here about that the government is good, everything, all the authority comes from God, those kinds of things. You should always subject yourself to authority. Like immediately where most people's brains go when they are reading Romans 13 is they immediately go to what are the loopholes and what are the exceptions? Like, like it, can't, it, it can't be that. So we just immediately jump from what Paul's saying to making sure that we've got loopholes for things that are important to us, okay? And so we can talk a little bit about those loopholes in a little bit, but I think it is very important first before we jump to loopholes, because when you do that, when you kind of go from Paul's making a statement to, I need to think about the loopholes, and you immediately go to that, and you skip past really analyzing what it is that Paul is definitively saying, then ultimately that's just kind of a very casual, seemingly biblical way of trying to dismiss something that Paul says. Well, I mean, but also it says this, Bible says this, Bible says this, Bible says this, and you immediately come to the other things that it says that might seem to contradict it. And really what you're doing is you're just neutering something that you don't particularly like. So instead of doing that, let's just look just at the statements that, uh, the affirmative statements that Paul's makes that I think at least the ones that are, I don't want to say non-controversial, but don't really have loopholes to them. The first one is, again, the hot take in verse one. 
There is no authority except that which God has established. And so what Paul is saying here is that there, that, that authority, um, that, that God, that is something that God seems that he directly oversees, that the people in authority are people that are there because God has put them there. Now, there are obviously some really bad, bad people, not the least of which was, was Nero, who was the, the emperor when Paul wrote this. There have been some really, really bad people that have been in authority. And Paul is saying that this, this, this authority, that this is something that God is orchestrating. And that may, you know, when you think about the worst people in history that have been in authority over, over countries, um, becomes a problem. We don't, you know, it, it makes us ask some questions about God and we'll get back to that, but let's just, let's just stay right there for right now. That's, that, that's number one. Authority in the government is something that God has established. And so then therefore that we are supposed to be subject to them, that we are as Christians obligated to follow the laws of the country that we live in. All right. And so then Paul verse two, anybody who rebels, you're rebelling against what God's instituted. And he says some things about, you know, verse three, rulers hold no terror for those who do right. Kind of makes you go, what? But then he goes back to verse four again, the one in authority is God's servant. This is something that God has done. And then, um, You get down to verse six, he talks very specifically about it. This is why you pay taxes. And and then ultimately verse seven, anything that the government says you owe them, you are supposed to pay taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. And so at its core, what Paul is saying here is that as what it means to be a citizen wherever you are, you are responsible to be a good subject of that place, okay? And that is based on the fact that God has placed those people in authority. And and so I think it's important for us to say, before we start getting into loopholes, before we start figuring out how can we say that God's put people in authority, we think about some of the worst monsters that have ever lived who have been over governments in the last, you know, two, three, four thousand years. Before we get to that, I think it's important for us to just kind of stick with the basic principle of as citizens, God expects us to have a humble and good attitude with our government. And when we start immediately going to what about Hitler and what about laws where they tell you you can't talk about Jesus before you go to kind of those worst examples, I think it is important for us as 21st century Christians to kind of stop and say, just because I can come up with extreme examples where this doesn't make sense, doesn't keep the principle from being true. And that principle being that God wants us to be good citizens. He wants us to be humble and he wants us to be servants. And, and, And a generalized attitude that we have that says, you know, I mean, sometimes we make, make this kind of joke, you know, hashtag not my president or Thanks, Obama. Thanks, Trump. Thanks, Biden, or whatever. I mean, like, we have this kind of just general angry attitude or one that says that I, I disavow everything. I mean, that's just not the attitude that, that Paul is calling us to here. And I don't think that the Bible calls us to. And um, if you've been around, if you, again, if you're around at the Grove, you're going to hear us talk about this a little bit with Daniel. In Daniel, we have, you know, uh, a group of Jews who have been exiled from their homeland and taken to Babylon. And in Babylon, they are being asked, they, they're in a place where I mean, Babylon has slaughtered a lot of Jewish people, ransacked them, kind of completely taken them over. The Babylonians were some of the cruelest people during that time. And the way that they laid siege to cities and what they did to survivors, I mean, it was brutal and awful. And so then they took several of them um, captive and brought them back to Babylon to kind of an attempt to assimilate them. And cover to cover, Daniel and his friends, we will see some examples of civil disobedience there for sure. However, what you will never see is active, angry rebellion. You will never see anything other than humility and a desire to serve their government. I mean, it really, if we just think about attitude specifically, I think that we really can't have an objection here because, again, 
cover to cover in the scripture, even when we see examples of civil disobedience, when you see in Daniel, when you see with Paul who got arrested, Jesus who got arrested, Jesus was actually fairly civil to the person who had the authority to execute him and who ultimately did. And then Jesus said the same thing to Pilate that Paul is saying here, which is you would not have this authority unless God had given it to you. And so we have Jesus who was living under Pilate, the guy who executed him unjustly. We've got Paul who was living under Nero who used Christians as torches um, and used them and killed them in the arena just for fun, just for sport to open up gladiator games. You know, we have these just kind of awful examples and it is in both of those examples that Paul and Jesus both say, Submit yourself to that. This authority comes from God. And so it is difficult then for us in 21st century um, America to say that somehow we've got it worse than either Jesus or Paul did. And so I think it is important. Again, I don't, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but I think some of these things are incredibly important. I think, I think Paul has a very specific word here for us, is that our hostile, angry, um, Attitude, it needs to change. And we need to have more of a Paul, Daniel, Jesus sort of attitude where we view ourselves as humble servants. Now, um, and so let me ask this question. What seems to be driving this? Why does Paul seem to be bringing this up? The, oh, the, the most specific thing that he says is in verse six, where he starts talking about paying taxes, which again is something that Jesus talks about when they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? which that particular passage and what I think we can learn about that will actually be what we will talk about in the next episode. But it seems to be here that what Paul is really getting at, he's being asked the same sort of question that Jesus was. What is our interaction? Like, what are we supposed to do? It's like, is it okay for us to pay taxes? Because they viewed the Roman government, the Roman occupation, Christians did as, as unlawful, as not good. Um, you know, there's all this talk when we talk about what the Bible says about our citizenship being in heaven, that we belong to God, not to people. Then what should be our interaction then with a government that seems to be hostile towards who we are? And again, Paul, who is writing this, has been imprisoned by this very same government before. And so it is, it's very clear, making a very specific thing to say, hey, even though there are times when you are interacting with this government that they may be unjust with you, it is your responsibility to give to this government what is asked of you, which really just, you put all of that together and it really speaks to something that the Bible seems to mention a lot, which makes your typical American and really should make all of us really just a little bit uncomfortable if we're really thinking about it, is that the Bible doesn't really speak to rebellion. It doesn't really say, you know, when you are in an unjust system where someone is, is hurting you, is exercising authority over you in a bad way, the Bible just very, merits, seems to always say, submit yourself to that, be humble in that, and really doesn't speak, is not, does not speak in a very pro-rebellion sort of way, which then leads to the very obvious question that people like to ask when you think about this passage is, what about 1776? Uh, what about the Revolutionary War? And I don't really know how you can read this passage, understand what Paul seems to be saying, and walk away with the idea that um, the American Revolution could have been God-ordained. I, mean, I, just, I, just, I, just I just don't know how you can say that. Um, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, that what the Declaration of Independence says where authority for government comes is that authority from government comes from the people, which is a very American thing. Rah, 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 democracy, we should vote, all those kinds of things. It's great. And those are really good principles, but that is not what Romans 13 says. Romans 13 says that does not say that leadership and authority is derived from the will of the people. It says it is ordained by God and that it is a good thing that we should not rebel against. That does not mean then that God was not orchestrating that and now has this authority. Um, now this authority is the one that we sub subject ourselves to, but it does, I think, this may feel controversial to some of you, but it, may, it does feel to me like 
it would be difficult to say that what the founders did was biblical. It was seen that maybe that God would have, you could best I think that you could say is that God used something that was not biblical, that goes against Romans 13 to produce something that he wanted, which is in fact what Romans 13 says. All authority is placed there by God. And so King George, he was placed there by God and should have been submitted to. He was overthrown and a new government is put up and now we should submit to that government as well. All right, so here's the thing. We need to make sure, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the loopholes because we see some loopholes even in Paul himself. There were places where Paul went where he was being told that he shouldn't preach about Jesus and he continued to do that. In the early parts of the book of Acts, they are brought, the apostles and the apostles are brought in by authorities to say, you have to stop talking about Jesus. And they would say, hey, you say whatever it is you want to say, um, we, got to, we got to keep doing what God says. In fact, says that... Um, the, the way that the, the apostles say it is that we must follow God rather than men. And again, in the book of Daniel, which I think has some of the best examples of what we'll call civil disobedience, uh, the, they were all asked to bow down to this giant idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had put together. And they refused to bow down to it. And they were ultimately cast into a fiery furnace, uh, which they survived. A little bit fast forward a little bit later, King Darius is there and a law is passed that for 30 days, you can only pray to the king. And Daniel refuses to do that and continues to pray to God every day. He does it in a way that he can be heard and noticed. And he is arrested and thrown into a lion's den. And so we have some very clear examples of civil disobedience where people have laws that are put before them that will have them run counter to what God says. And they were, and they refused to obey. And so I think that civil disobedience is of incredible importance. I mean, I think that there are some examples of that where you, if God says A and the government says B, you must do A. If, if the government says you can't do A, but God says you must do it, you do it. And, and, and so I think the principle in Paul's life, in Jesus's life, and cover to cover in the scripture is when these two things come into conflict, God's law prevails. And we have examples of that again with Daniel, with Jesus, and with the apostles. But again, even in all of those things, there never seems to be anything close to what we would call rebellion. And in fact, if you go to the book of Daniel, chapter one, when they say, hey, we can't eat those we can't eat that food because it's against our diet. Chapter two, when it talks about um, bowing down to the idol, a little bit later, I'm just going to, I think it's, I think it's chapter five, Daniel on the lion's den, maybe chapter six, chapter six, anyways, it's talking about not praying, gets thrown into the lion's den. In none of those examples, is there an attempt of revolution? At no point in any of that is, are Daniel and his friends saying, um, not only can we not do this, but you shouldn't do this either. No, not a lot of judgment about people who don't follow God, acting like they don't follow God. Just quiet, humble following of their convictions and refusing to follow a law that they believe that goes against what God has called them to do. And so I think, I think that then is our principle. Our principle is my attitude needs to be one of humble service and I will always put God over government. But if there is no conflict, then I will be subject to the governing authorities that I have. And so, again, we've got some examples here, some really, really bad things in history. Stalin, Hitler, and, and people, people like that, where there are just awful things. And civil disobedience was absolutely called for. No, no, one, no one is going to speak out, <laughs> certainly not on this podcast. No one is going to say that, that you know, hel helping Jewish people hide during the Holocaust was a bad thing because they weren't being subject. Or anyone would speak about the Underground Railroad um, during the times of slavery here. I mean, those are incredible things because there's some very important things that God has called us to, to love and serve and to care for people. But again, I just think, I just, I just think it's important to make sure that we're checking our own attitude and to not use extreme examples from history to prevent us from having a, 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 the attitude that we should have, which is one of 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And so depending on who you are and who you voted for, Maybe these last two years have been a struggle for you, or maybe it was the four before that. If these two were a struggle for you, the eight before the last four were the struggle for you. But I think there's, there's a principle at play here that, that, that Paul is saying is, you know, the, the government is an umbrella of protection for you, and you need to trust and submit to that. And you think, I don't know if I really trust that umbrella But what if, and this is what the Bible says, what if God has a bigger umbrella and his umbrella incorporates that umbrella? Maybe I can't trust this government, but I trust the God who oversees it. And that even if what is happening is bad, even if what I'm seeing, I experience and I believe to be evil, I can trust in the authority that God has under an authority that he seems to have established that I don't particularly trust. Now, before I was preparing for this, I was just kind of looking out there. It's like, man, what, what, are, what are other people saying about this? And I ran across just a couple of very interesting pod, uh, blog posts. And one of them in particular was really around why it is, in fact, okay to not wear a mask, even though you've been mandated to wear a mask. And it was some very convoluted thinking. And my favorite, my favorite, my favorite piece, piece that I saw in one of them was you can rebel against the government because the government is not the ultimate authority the Constitution is. And so anything that you don't think really is valid through the Constitution, you have every right to disobey anything. And then you think, okay, that was, that was, that's, that's something. And then it ultimately ended up in and mass restrict freedom and there's nothing about mass in the Constitution. You don't have to wear a mask. And I'm telling you, that's the attitude that I think Romans 13 is speaking against. I mean, we made a decision, and it, it didn't mean for it to be controversial at the time, but I guess that it was when we were going through this two years ago. And um, Asa Hutchinson, our governor, he said that churches didn't have, he didn't feel like he had any right to restrict churches in any way, but he asked, would, we, would churches be willing to limit and not to meet in large groups for a certain period of time? And would you be willing to wear masks under these circumstances and those kinds of things? And I felt it was very important, again, based on this principle, even though we theoretically have the freedom to do what we want, and even though our governor is telling us, you absolutely do have the freedom to do what you want, would you be willing to do this? And it was a small inconvenience. Um, Some people didn't like it. Some people really, really didn't like it. It was a minor inconvenience. But compared to what I think is a very clear principle of Scripture, which is to say that our heart and attitude needs to be one of humble service and submission, it seemed like a very small thing for us to say, we we will do what our governor is asking us to do. And so, again, this passage is not saying that every time the government does everything, everything is good, That that the government is absolutely right and aligned with God and morals 100% of the time. But I think he does have an incredible thing to say to us is it really that sometimes our attitude needs to be adjusted, that we, we, do not, we do not want to be known as angry protesters. We want to be known as humble servants. And there's just the difference between civil disobedience. There's even the difference between civil disobedience and protesting something that you believe to be unjust. There's a difference between that and storming the Capitol. There's a difference between that and burning a building down in a riot. And we want to be known as thoughtful, kind, and humble people, even when we disagree, and even when we disagree to the point to where we feel like civil disobedience or some manner of protest is called for. I would just encourage you to be more thoughtful, more humble, and more trusting of God. So we're just kind of launching here. Hopefully I haven't made you too upset that you won't come back and listen to a couple more of these where we just can just kind of process because I I think it's important and I think it starts there with our attitude. Our attitude, is our attitude one of trust in God and humble service or is it one of anger and distrust? And so we'll keep talking about this over the next couple of weeks and thanks for joining us. And if you are local, we would love to 
connect with you at the Grove Church sometime where you could come and uh, visit us. You find out all about it at thegrovechurch.org slash connect. If you're not local and you'd like to connect with us, you have any questions or thoughts or anything like that, feel free to fill out that form there. You can join us as we stream our services online. And again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor at The Grove, and you have a great day.